Yeah, so uh, the benefit of uh, last talk of the session, I guess uh, some of the diagram I'm going to show are probably getting very familiar. So this is, again, just a breakdown of the modern uh, generative AI data center networking. We're basically looking at now uh, a lot more, how to say, portion of the network now added to the overall data center. So you can see the AI accelerators actually has its own network called scaled up network. And then to further scale up to a scale out network, you're basically adding uh, more GPUs to the network. So that's talking about tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of those GPUs. Then you still need to worry about integrating the whole networks with general compute and storage, et cetera. So the network itself getting complex. And you also need to worry about the scale out, either also between multiple buildings. Uh, actually, one building is not enough to even supply the power you need and footprint you need. So there's really now four portion of the network I'm going to discuss today. So this is, a, I would say, just a cartoon view of what the AI server is going to look like. Uh, so you actually need to support all these different portions of the network. Uh, on the downside here, I actually draw multiple of these connections. Uh, that's where the bandwidth is really requirement is very big for XPU to scale up. Uh, actually, the like Blackwell portion of the net, uh, how the generation of GPU actually required like 7.2 terabit per second. So it's really in the range of 10 terabit per second, much more than what we talk about today in the front end and scale out network, where it's like 800 gig, 400 gig, still dominant and still growing in that market, maybe upgrading to 1.60, but in the scale up portion of the network, it's already like close to 10 terabit per second. So this is actually both a challenge, but also opportunity for optics. And there's really, right now, there's uh, multiple, I would say, protocols there. Uh, NVLink is really uh, proprietary for NVIDIA, but there's also other uh, industry consortiums uh, looking at, like, UA Link, and uh, I think discussed earlier, and uh, either even PCIe may actually be implemented in some of these uh, proprietary uh, accelerator networks. And then on the upper uh, right side, uh, we're basically looking at earlier discussion about PCIe for memory, for storage extensions. And this is less discussed, but I think uh, over time, this portion of memory expansion is going to be very critical for uh, AI networking as well. Uh, so obviously, price of optics is on this scale up because the bandwidth is so big. So uh, to go from today's, if you go to the Catalina, actually just released by uh, Meta, basically it's a MVL72 equivalent. It's all copper. You can see actually 5,000 coppers actually in the back side of this rack. Uh, but only 72 GPUs in that rack, and it's burning 140 kilowatts of that. Um, so to go optical, then you can actually scale to more GPUs. This is the challenge we have. And how do you do that? So there's a few, I will call it targets, right? You need really high reliability. I think you talked about this earlier. You need low cost. Uh, I will call it a small fraction of GPUs. It's not free, it's not zero cost, but had to be small fraction. And then power as well. I mean, it's not zero power, but power had to be small fraction of the GPUs, and then high bandwidth we just talk about, and then high bandwidth density, because this is where you need to have that 10 terabit coming out of the ASIC very effectively. So I'm going to share some data. Uh, so uh, in the industry, we know silicon photonics is, uh, you know, we've been working on it for decades, and uh, high variability need to be demonstrated in the field deployment. So we are doing our part, we're actually shipping in the last few years, over 3 billion device hours now and counting, actually continue to increase that, you know, quickly gonna go to maybe order magnitude of that uh, in the next few quarters. Uh, but we are basically showing the silicon photonic peak in the field data can be very reliable. We basically can show the silicon photonic uh, peak fit rate now is below 0.4. So this is like really good data. I think we can continue to work with the industry to actually showing the integrated photonic truly can address high reliability requirement. Uh, this is another chart I want to share with you, but uh, thanks a lot. Uh, Light Counting allow me to use their uh, published data 
to show how as a pluggable optics industry continue to drive the cost down. So I've seen there's a benchmark about 0.1, uh, basically dollar per gigabit. And, and if you're looking at you know next few years with higher degree of integration, with integrated photonics, with more channel count inside the transceiver, we actually are marching really towards that goal. So we're saying is optics is not necessarily have to cost uh, very expensive. Actually, we are really doing our part, continue to drive the cost down and continue to actually go towards that goal of 0.1 uh, gigabit per second. Sorry, dollar per gigabit. Uh, then this is really talking about energy efficiency. So linear optics uh, has been, I think, the hot topic in the last few years. Uh, Andy here has been the champion of linear optics. And uh, we think this is the right thing to do if you continue to go forward. Uh, this is where you can actually achieve this almost step jump of cost, uh, sorry, uh, energy efficiency reduction. So we are showing if you keep marching on the retimer, uh, fully retime the optics uh, domain, you probably can get to more like a 15, you know, pico joule per, uh, per bit. But if you really want to go uh, to linear optics, you actually uh, can really go down even further uh, with a double the data rates with more efficient optics. You can really get to about six uh, pico joule per bit. So those are the good area of progress for optics. And again, it's not going to be zero power. So the, the key point here is even at 7.2 terabit per second, even using linear optics as we used to, uh, like a pluggable linear optics, we, we basically can be a very small fraction of the GPU power, right? So that's a key point. And we're doing our part demonstrating, you know, these uh, linear optics works. So we're actually doing, uh, uh, I think earlier mentioned, there's an ECOG. OIFCI, a linear interop demo, and we participate in that. So there's multiple vendors. There's uh, a switch uh, integrated in that demo. So um, industry is doing our part to really showing uh, the linear optics really works if you do it right. And uh, this is uh, what we think is the right area for the industry to look at is how do we extend this pluggable optics has been good to us, you know, generation after generation for the last, uh, you know, 10, 15 years. And the key is when we continue to double and double the data rate, this robust uh, linear optics require a low loss uh, between ASIC two. I think there's a few speakers in before already addressed this issue. I think industry is coming to certain conclusion to provide a high density connector with copper cables to the front side to address this fan out requirement to the optical pluggables, then you can address several very important areas of requirement, reliability, uh, capable support, very high density, you know, around one terabit per second per millimeter. These are the matrix I think uh, industry need to get to. Uh, recently, uh, there's a contribution to IEEE actually proposed this channel model allow you to actually control this ASIC to uh, pluggable um, cable link uh, to within a few dB uh, at uh, 53 uh, gigahertz. And earlier we uh, hear there are contributions now working at double this uh, bar rate again. So uh, there's actually quite promising to continue to preserve the pluggability of the optics. At the same time, we can address all the linear optics low uh, power requirement, and then continue to really innovate on the pluggables. So uh, one thing I like to highlight is the pluggability itself is not a limitation of how many channels you can put in. And traditionally, we are go on this cadence of every few years, you know, doubled up again. But that's not engineering constraint. That's more of a front end network. Really, they just doing that every, you know, two, three years, you jump the speed. but. As a community, we can actually innovate on pluggables. You can put in 16 lanes, you can put in 32 lanes in that pluggable. So this is a, uh, another open call for action for our community is continue to really innovating in the pluggable optics, but continue to address the end customer requirements. And by the way, showing that picture, actually inside the box of NVIDIA, actually this is their MV switch. So they're actually already using these cables uh, going from their switch AC to the edges of the board. 
So actually, it's already deployed in this kind of uh, scenarios. And then, uh, obviously, we do want to leave that option for CPO as well. I think at a certain time, a certain bar rate uh, where the CPO will be necessary is just because you need to cut down the loss uh, further between the ASIC and the optics. But uh, I, I would like to advocate for a mountable CPO rather than currently, I think there's a few versions in the market where it's a sort fully soldered down, it's fully closed system with a tight coupling with switch or ASIC. So these are the system post significant problem for the end users because now it's become a fixed configuration when you even start to deliver that fully packaged ASIC. And they're very hard to repair, very hard to replace. So that becomes a very high cost from operation point of view. And if it's an open system, this is you know OCP. So we like to have a more open mountable CPO where you can actually address the high density requirement, but you enable a open ecosystem, just like pluggable. So it's like a pluggable version of CPO. I think as industry, I think we need to move that way. We need to continue to keep that as open ecosystem. And we need to address the customer pain point uh, as a part of that solution set. And we are working with uh, OIF. Uh, there's a EEI uh, mentioned earlier. So we like to work in those community to continue. Okay, so I'll have to speed up. So uh, PCI optics, so I won't spend a lot of time, but we're doing our part to demonstrate, you know, optics work, linear optics works, actually for, you know, PCIe optics up to Gen 7 demonstrated. And then for scaled out, I think this is the cadence we talk about. You know, every two years now, you need to double the speed again. So this is the cadence we are working on. Uh, I'll just give you one example now for adoption of linear optics. We actually see our customer base now, very promising to adopt linear optics first as a NIC car, because this is the area you have the full control of very short distance between your DPUs or whatever ASIC, but then to the optics. So this is the area you're gonna see linear optics adopted uh, very quickly, even up to 224 um, gigabit per second. And I'm gonna talk just briefly about uh, DC campus. But this is the area where you require multiple buildings to connect, interconnect you know, all the data center together. So this is the area, if you continue to now march on to a higher uh, bit rate per lane, you start to see problem. And within IEEE, we're actually discussing recently about 200 gig uh, per lane addressing uh, uh, LR, so it's LR4, so you have 200 gig per lane, but then you had to start to use like LAN WDM with much tighter wavelength control. And then if you go to 400 gig, that will become a problem because then your dispersion tolerance cut back by four times. So that will be significant challenges uh, for us to deal with. And I'm just uh, offering up one of the potential solutions actually is continue to use parallel optics, but using like a multi-core fiber as an innovation in industry, I think uh, there are customers telling us they are dealing with the potentially 5,000 cable hanging out of one rack. Uh, so you need to cut down the number of fibers. And you know, if you start to think about like multi-core fiber, you actually start to pack like eight cores, four cores, eight core in one fiber. So you can cut down the fiber count by four times, eight times. So these are the innovation I think we need to encourage the community to start consider. And then also, in this case, you can actually get a better dispersion handling because now you just single wavelengths, you don't spread out too much. You can actually handle distance using parallel optics a lot easier. Um, and at a certain time, you know, uh, coherent light will start to become a key play uh, because we had to continue to look at 400 gig per lane. In that case, to go 10 kilometer, you're going to need solution like coherent light because that's where you can truly uh, deal with the dispersion uh, problems uh, of fiber. Um, so, anyway, uh, in a nutshell, I, I think we are continuing to develop the right solutions for the industry and energy efficiency and high bandwidth, those are the critical area I think we need to address, particularly for AI scale up, because that's actually where the highest bandwidth needed, and you need to scale much bigger number of GPUs to continue to support that scaling law of AI, which is really important. Uh, I think you showed earlier, we don't see the end yet for that continue to scale, and 
to have an optical solution and networking solution to continue to support that is critical. So we'll do our part to support. And also, from call to action point of view, uh, we do like to encourage an open ecosystem. So we're doing our part to support OIF, OCP, and uh, those are the community we come together uh, to really address uh, solutions where with open ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ren Chen. <coughs> Sorry, we don't have time for questions as usual, but <laughs> great suggestions. The compromise, pluggable CPO. CPC, uh, pluggable, I think that would be a solution. CPO. Now, to go to CPO, uh, uh, so, so I had some earlier discussion uh, as well on this. Is, Right now, it seems to be pluggable and CPO almost like polar opposite. Like, like people fight each other, say, I had to go to CPO, I had to go to pluggable. I, I think as a community, as an engineering community, I think we need to think about what customer pain point is. And really coming out like, what is sort of more old thinking or tradition forcing us to think inside the box a certain way versus like we really had to look at what the pain point is, how to use collective wisdom and experience to address the customer pain point. I, I think there's lots of ways between like completely sealed uh, closed ecosystem of CPO or perceived CPO versus like pluggable here is very open. I think we can find a middle ground. Good, good plan, good plan. Thank you, Rang Chen. Um, Thank you.